right, let's dive into the Word. I'm going to be very practical, very basic, maybe a little militant in honor of Veterans Day, um, but I do feel like I have a specific assignment from the Lord this morning to talk about a tough topic to talk about without getting into a very maybe hard-nosed zone, so um, just know going in, I'm not trying to beat anyone up in our thing. I just want us to be really equipped um, in, in some things and, and stable in some things, and that word will probably come up a few times this morning, but I want to talk about being paired, and originally I was writing these notes about just about how we're paired with God, being in sync with God, being connected to God, and God really flipped this direction right before service, and so um, everything I was teaching got hijacked again, kind of like last week, and um, I really just feel like God's heart this morning is that we are built up as a body, because that's, that. how, how many guys know that that's one of the ways that we actually fully connect to what the Holy Spirit's doing is through one another. Here's, here's what I'll say. Um, and again, I'm going to speak this from a place of authority because I've been this person. But the, the whole like, I'm a nomad, it's just me and Jesus, life is not Jesus. Amen. Amen. The, the whole, I'm too good for the church and again, the church isn't a building, it's not a 10 a.m. service, it's a people. But when you think you have outgrown the church, you're saying you've outgrown Jesus himself because he dispensed himself in a many-membered body, to dis- not, not in a body that's in agreement all the time, not in a body that even likes to come together with one another all the time, but he died for this. And any time you're outside of this, you might as well throw dirt at him. Amen? I used to be that person, so I can rebuke that person. Because the Lord rebuked me. Amen. And I get it. I get frustrations with the church. I get frustrations with organizations. I mean, I, I get it. Personally, here's my, you ready for my personal thing? Well, I, I won't say this, but if, if I had it my way, like for me, I'm content if whether there was a stage or lights or a 10 a.m. or a, whatever, I don't care. Personally, don't care. I like that we can do it. I like the freedom of it. I like that we can come in here and pop balloons in Jesus' name if we want to. And and we've got that freedom. So thank God again to the veterans. But I don't care how we do it or what it looks like. I I just want to do it. Amen. Um, And somewhere in the midst of how we do it, Jesus is just being Jesus. Our greatest goal is to stay connected in unity and faith, not divide, not, I mean, come on, the New Testament is so full of us. You understand the New Testament writings, they didn't sit down and decide they're going to write a textbook for future generational church gatherings who meet on Sundays and are going to read and get instruction from it. That's great, but the New Testament writings came from what they were living, not what they were talking about or thinking about. This is what they lived, and they lived together. And the New Testament is full of Scripture, and we've got a lot of Scripture to cover this morning, but so much that I've left out. The New Testament is full of this apostolic movement trying to constantly get people just to stay together. So powerful. Amen? So I'll say this, the the sideline Jesus ministry of, well, I report to Jesus, not to a pastor, not to a... Michael, not to uh, anybody. Like, I, Jesus is my dude, and he's my only accountability. Bull honky. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. I love that. You should have that relationship with Jesus in your life. Amen. Yes. Church should not be your relationship with God. It should be the strength and part of the strength of your relationship, but it is definitely not a substitute. Amen. But it's never you, Han Solo, and Jesus who are going to be the messianic rebirth of the world. It's going to be a many-membered body who carry an anointing and an expression of Jesus that the world is longing for, looking for a family. Do you understand that our greatest like, move of evangelism will not be that we went out and preached the gospel, and this might be risky to say, but it's going to be because we modeled what the family of God is supposed to look like. That's what people are going to be drawn to and flock to. People weren't following Jesus just because of what he was preaching. They were following him because of what he looked like, what he felt like, what the atmosphere was like when they were around him. They didn't even understand it most of the time, but they were drawn and connected to him because he carried something, not because he talked about something. Amen? And again, I love church. I love that we can do this. But it's never going to be a substitute for the point. Okay, so let's read this really quick in 
A lot of scripture this morning, and um, I'm going to try to stay focused on topic. Matthew 12, verse 30. There might be a couple I've thrown in back there, Tiana, that you might have to pull up that I didn't put online because I'm, I'm chasing the Lord a little bit this morning, and I keep adding verses. Matthew 12, 30. In the NIV, the nearly inspired version, it says this. <laughs> Whoever is not now... Let me preface this. I'm, I'm borrowing this from context to get the principle of it, but let's look at this. This is Jesus talking. Whoever is not with, say with, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather, say gather, whoever does not gather with me scatters. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now, in that term with, we also have to remember that Jesus isn't just sitting there 2,000 years ago still talking about things. Jesus has ascended to the Father. The Holy Spirit has come in Acts chapter 2. It has been dispensed on a multi-membered body. And so Jesus is not off somewhere. Jesus is in this room spread out in the life of believers. Amen. So if we're going to gather with Jesus, it's not just about finding Jesus in the flesh, one dude. It's about getting together with the place that he is, with what he's become. You are the body of who? Christ. So if I'm going to gather with him, that means this is necessary. Amen? Now, how many of you guys have Bluetooth devices? It's awesome, isn't it? I got, some, I got some Bluetooth headphones the other day. And... They're like these little bud things, so I'm afraid I'm going to lose one, but you pop them in, hit the button, where you hit the button first, pair them, but you have to pair these things, right? And so what you do is you hit the little button, it starts blinking, okay? And it starts blinking, and whatever you're pairing to on the other side is usually either blinking or you got to pull it up and connect like to my phone, but there's a response on one side and a blink on the other. There's blink, 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 every say blinkity blink, blinkity blink. Blinkity blink. And what they're doing is they're looking for a place to connect. They're looking for a device to connect to. It's a great technology. I'm sure it's probably bad for our health. But when in Rome, just pop them in. So I'm popping them in and I'm connecting these things, right? And when they're connected, they're connected so that whatever information I send out of my phone, whether it's music or whatever, is now connected and coming through the thing that's in my ear, okay? Without a wire, which is, that's, that's crazy. If you'd have told me when we were kids um, that you'd have like screens like this that you could just touch and move around, you'd be like, oh my gosh, we're gonna live in spaceships, like <laughs> technology. Um, but that's where we're at, like you connect this thing. And I was thinking about this also this morning because I've got a little Bluetooth thing in my car, but my car itself has Bluetooth. And so what happens is, my phone will connect to the phone system in my car, and I can talk on the phone. But if I want to play music, this is before Apple CarPlay came out, um, I have to I'm connect to this other little Bluetooth thing and play music so I don't have to find the wire and all that. Who wants to do that? We don't have time for that. We're a chosen generation. Um, and so, so I don't have time for all that. So you connect. The problem here is that sometimes if I'm connected to both, it starts skipping. And so if I'm listening to a song, I was trying to get into worship this morning, and this part of a chorus, I'm just like, yeah, God, come and move today. And all of a sudden, it skips. And it just ruined the moment. Because it it's, like it's like the enemy knew the song was building, and it was about to hit that part where you're like, yeah, let's go after it. Let's make a declaration. And it was like, boop. And the reason it was skipping is because it was still connected to my car at the same time it was connected to the receiver. And the problem is when you're connected to the both, there's interference, there's distraction, and it doesn't know which one to follow, which one to send information to or get information from. So there's these little moments where you're getting information, but it's not all of the information. It's not fully connected. It's distracted. Everybody say fully connected. connected. Here's what I know. There's a lot of believers on the earth that are looking for their best life now, their purpose-driven whatever. They're trying to figure out how to... perfect and get better at the Christian stuff, whether it's doing more, praying more, eating more, eating less, leaving this out, adding this in, doing these seven principles, that fourth principle, whatever it is, going to that meeting or this meeting or going to church more, serving on the team. Here's the problem with fully connecting to the Lord. Sometimes we're doing it outside of his body. And as much as it can be painful, 
you will never fully be connected to the purpose and call of God in this life outside of his body, period. If you disagree with that this morning, have a great life, but it's not biblical. Amen? Jesus died for this. He didn't die for you, he died for us. Amen? He didn't anoint you, he anointed us. There's a lot of repercussions that come from being disconnected from the body. One of those is you think your Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Amen. But I know, just from being in both places at times in my life, that sometimes I need someone with the Holy Spirit as well to correct what I thought was the Holy Spirit. Because I only know in part, prophesy in part, see in part. And sometimes when I think it's the whole, it's only a piece. And I'll never finish the puzzle on my own. I'll never see the, 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 the world really come to the light of Jesus on my own. We've got to be able to do it together. Amen? So Jesus says... This principle, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Scatters. Hebrews 10, verse 24, a lot of you guys know these verses, and this morning is going to be primarily probably text. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. He's talking about becoming stronger. He's talking about being equipped. He's talking about edification. Not giving up, verse 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. How we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. In other words, how we become stronger in this thing by not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Acts chapter 2, verse number 42 And this is the, the area I'm going to be cautious this morning because it's easy to call out stuff. And I, I do want to say this, like, when it seems like we maybe correct certain things or ideologies, it's not because we're so mature that we can do that. It's because I'm under the authority of the word that I can do that. If the word's clear on something, then what, I don't care how spiritually mature you are, you're under the authority of a higher authority than yours to be able to say, here's how it's supposed to be. Amen? Um, that doesn't mean you're the king and everyone's crazy, but there are things that are just simply there in the word. Amen? Um, I, I Say it this way. Oh, man, Jesus, help me. This is tough. If I offend you this morning, I am kind of sorry. Um, I'm sorry that you're offended. <laughs> uh, but it's not my intention. It really isn't. My intention is, because I believe, again, we're blessed. You guys are great. We, we gather. I think we get this principle, but I, I want us to be so strong in it. That we literally are such, such a house, such a pillar, and a light in a community that that petty stuff is, just doesn't even almost entertain us anymore. Amen? Here's the thing I do know. Churches aren't used cars. Okay? You don't swap out because a new model comes out. That's what we do, though. We're, we're, we're human. We're frail. We get bored. We get distracted. And we think, man, I've been here, and it's kind of, you know, it's what it is, and I'm used to these seats and this sound or this, the fact that it doesn't have Bluetooth, and, and that new model looks nice. But guess what's going to happen? You're going to upgrade. It's going to cost you a lot. Ten years is going to go by, and a new model is going to come out. And you've got to move again. And then you've got to move again. Then you've got to move again. Then you've got to move again. There will always be something shiny around for you to make as an excuse to be in movement constantly. I, I want to read, before we read Acts, let me read this one because I think this helps. 1 Corinthians 14, For God is not a God of disorder. He's not the author of confusion. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. God is not a God of disorder. Okay? Now, he, I'll tell you who I used to be. I used to be the guy that hated anything with order. I thought it was controlled, manipulated, quenching the spirit. I thought, why we got to meet at 10? Let's just roll in and see what happens. And I like that. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But it's not one or the other. There's nothing wrong with having a meeting time and showing up and saying, let's park some cars, let's see some people, let's, let's have a little bit of order to things that we do and be stewards of what God's doing and partner with that. There's nothing wrong with having order. In fact, God is not a God of disorder. When you think that God is a hippie who doesn't care, look at the sun, the moon, and the stars. They have order, they have consistency, they have an assignment, and they do not move. That is his creation. That is what he is like. Because Romans says, for the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being in the things that are made. Meaning, if I don't really know, if I understand God, look at creation and how it works. It's extremely detailed, extremely ordered, and extremely consistent. If it wasn't consistent, we'd all be dead. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, wish you would. No, don't. <laughs> If it wasn't consistent and the sun moved just a little bit too close, we're gone. He's a God of order, not of disorder. Amen? I used to be the one who criticized churches because they had order. I love, this is going to be a good day. So quiet. I love this stuff. Awkward silence is my friend. And when I find it, I just like to peel it open and see why. <laughs> I used to be the guy, I, hate, I had just hated church because I had, I had encountered the presence of God. Came out of a life of concepts of God and law and ritual and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, God was real. Changed my life. Changed my life. And I was so hungry and it felt so lied to that I thought everything was a sham. Everything was a conspiracy. Everything was a cover up. And the real God was outside. He was in the woods. And I was going to go out there and eat locusts and start preaching the gospel and raise people from the dead. And it was passion. And God birthed things in my life out of that. But then he also corrected me out of that. I started to make it the model. I started to make it the thing. I started to throw rocks at the Lord's body and I started to abuse his bride rather than gather with the place that he still is in. Even if they're off course sometimes, he's still there. Come on, he was still God in, in, in Israel when they were lost for 30 years, for 35 years, for 38 years. They're still wandering around, but he's still God even though they're off course, even though they've turned their back multiple times, even though they messed it up constantly. He was still providing manna from heaven. He was still provision for them. He was still God. And let me, let me say this, even if, I couldn't find a church that I agreed with. I'm at that place in my life. I would pick one and go. <laughs> it's quiet. <laughs> I'm, if you're here and this is your church, well, it's great. Proud of you. If you go to another one, great. Just, just go somewhere and be the body. Don't be a stone. Be the body. Amen. Amen. Even if I couldn't find a church, that's what I struggled with, and part of this is testimony this morning, but I struggled because I was so hungry for God, for his presence. I, I just wanted to see the sick healed, the dead raised all the time, and I still do. But what I found myself doing is going to places, only searching for what was missing and not searching for him. And so I could go into a church that maybe was a little bit stale, and rather than still find God in the midst... I was so full of criticism that all I could do was tear down. And you know, the Lord spoke to me one time, just clear as a bell, and I rebuked him as the devil and then realized it was him later. But out of that season, the Lord spoke to me clear and said, stop hitting my bride. And I thought, no way, because I was so full of passion. It justified it. I was like, no, man, this is Holy Ghost. I'm not going to, like, this is, oh, Jesus. And it was good, and just because it was good for a time doesn't mean it was sustainable in the assignment of God. You know, when God does something, it's constant, right? In, in, in fact, like when you look at that word disorder in, in, the, in the Greek, when it said he's not a God of disorder of confusion, it means unstable, instability. He's not a God that's unstable. He's not a God, I think, I think it also translates into the word commotion. It was just kind of like this. Now, we know that he's unstable sometimes in the sense that he can do crazy stuff. Walking on the water is not very stable to our paradigm, but it was definitely stable to his. He might be unstable to our understanding sometimes, but he's always stable in himself. Amen? 
He's not a God of disorder. He is a God of stability. You know what really distinguishes mature believers from immature believers? And I'm saying this because I'm not the most mature believer. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but what I, I, one thing that I, th- I think is, has to be there to say that, man, somebody's really mature in their faith is that there's stability and consistency. Amen? Meaning, just like the, the word says, they're not tossed to and fro by every strange wind of doctrine. In other words, a new model come, doesn't come out, and they're like, oh my gosh, got to have it. This place is crazy. You've got to go over here. They've got the real stuff. <laughs> this is awesome. I love Sundays like this. Let's go to this place, because this place died, man. Let's go over there, because these guys just do four songs. And then they go into the message, and good Lord, could we just do something different? Do something different. Who? Whew. Last time I checked, we weren't supposed to be coming in here looking at how we did it in the first place. Right. It wasn't about how many songs we did or didn't do. I don't care if we came in, there were no songs. I don't care if Jim burps and the Holy Ghost falls. I don't care what <laughs> happens if we're here looking for Jesus. He's, he'll, he'll be here. Amen. And here's what I know. Even in the churches that have no, no shred of the signs of the Holy Ghost, they could be so anti-Holy Ghost. I guarantee you Jesus is in the boat somewhere if you just look. He might be asleep, but he's in there. Amen. He might be asleep, but he's in there just waiting on somebody to wake him up. Amen. But it doesn't matter. We've got to get outside of criticism and start seeking the Lord. Amen. We've got to get outside of preference and start seeking the Lord. Constantly, New Testament writers, the early apostles, imagine how much they're dealing with the early church where the gospel is going to different regions. And with each region comes a different context, a different culture, with different issues, with different problems, with different challenges. You've got areas where Gnosticism is dominant. You've got all these movements within the movement happening, and he's correcting them on different levels. In one place, he corrects in a different way that he has to correct another because they're in different places. Imagine how many movements moving parts there are in the early church, yet they're fighting for one thing. I don't care that you all just agree about all the little details. Just stick together on him. Make him the issue. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. When you're cut off from the body, you're toast. Amen? When I see people, they're like, man, I'm, I'm just starving in my faith, or they're struggling in life, or they're whatever. It's because somewhere they're not paired. They're disconnected, they're blinking, saying, where are you? But they refuse to connect to another device. And sometimes that device is Jim. Sometimes it's Brad. Sometimes it's Will. Sometimes it's Michael. Sometimes I've got to find that blink somewhere and realize when that blink finds the other blink, we can connect on the main thing. And sometimes that's when one cries to another, he is good, he is holy. Worthy is the lamb. I need to find someone else to exalt him with because that's going to be what connects my heart to the fullness and the purpose of God. You will not find it hiding in the cave trying to prophesy how bad things have gotten. Amen. That's the type of mentality that he rebukes and says, go back because I have an assignment for you. It doesn't matter what it looks like to you. The assignment is not relevant to your perception. Amen. I want to be connected to Jesus, but that does mean that I have to be connected to the body. Now, I want to say this too, and this is one area I will still be cautious. I love you guys, because I have to. It's Christian. (laughs) No, I I really do love you guys. Um, No, I do. I promise. I promise I do. I promise. One of the things that I think we struggle with I think this is on my heart, not my heart, but I really felt like this was the Lord's heart this morning. Is we live in a generation where we will swap everything at the flip of a switch. Don't like it, go to the next thing. Don't like that one, go to the next. Swipe, swipe. Come on, that's how people date now. Because we we don't, come on, man. We're too scared now to talk to women and ask them out on a date, so we do it through a freaking device. Sorry for saying freaking, but... But we do it through a device because we don't, we don't have the testosterone anymore to say, hey, 
I like you. How are you doing? I'm a man. I'm a man who likes your pretty face. And I'd like to tell you about that. But we don't do it. We hide behind stuff now and we just swipe. What's the one? There's one of the apps where they just swipe. And it's like we pile them up. There's, there's, there's one where they, they pile them up. Like if they like them, you swipe and it goes into, the, what is it? Yeah, it's like the like column and then the other one goes into the discard section or something. I don't know. But it's like, come on, how devastatingly shallow is that? Oh, she's cute. He's cute. He ugly. Throw him. Put him in the bin with the rubbish. And Yep. Yep. Nope. Nope. This is the world that we live in. Amen? But the overflow, that is only a byproduct of how we treat pretty much everything in life now. If we don't like it, we swipe to the next one. So we don't mind going $40,000 in debt to buy the new car because we're tired of the old one. Swipe. Don't care what it costs me. I just got to have it. Swipe. Swipe. Old TV's working fine, but this one's two inches bigger. Swipe. 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 Never thinking about the cost. Never thinking about the fact that now I'm going to be under the weight and the stress and the burden of debt just because I don't have this beautiful fruit called self-control. Swipe. Swipe. Swipe, swipe, swipe. Well, the Spirit left this place. Swipe. Let's go down the street to the church where they don't have any order. And let's just listen to Jim burp all day. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Who knows what's going to happen? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Because I do believe. I, I, first off, you, we have to be a people who will allow the Holy Spirit to hijack our order at any moment. Amen. So that's, never, that's not what I'm talking about. But to think that God is outside of just the common church and that we've outgrown it or too good for it or it's the wrong way is nothing but pride, immaturity, and arrogance. Amen. That's just what it is. Even if some of your opinions might be right, your function isn't. You never sever from the Lord's body just because you don't like what it's doing. Yeah? Um, and we'll read a lot more scriptures, but I want to say this in uh, Acts 2.42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. This is, again, early church birth. A lot of things are taking place, a lot of context. So the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with all the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions. These guys literally modeled family on another level. They sold property and possessions to give anyone, uh, give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Nowhere does it say that they agreed about everything. These guys are on a journey. They're being transitioned from an old covenant into a new one. There is a lot of stuff to fight about. There's a lot of conversations to be had. There's a lot of what ifs, how do we do this now? What about this? What about that? And you see this all through the New Testament. I mean, it's give and take, give and take, give and take. But in the middle, the beauty of this tapestry called the church is that they're staying together, being woven together. In the midst of all the unknowns, they're still doing the journey together. Amen? In a swipe right, swipe left generation, we divide at the flip of a switch because we get offended, because we don't like something, because we don't like a message, because we don't like a song, because we don't like a style, because we don't like a whatever. And that's got to stop. Amen? It just has to stop because the world's watching that and saying, why in the world would I want to be part of that? Come on, we've got this thing, and I don't want to get on this, but we have a certain guy in Hollywood who's had a God encounter, which I just seems to me is very legit. The gospel's being preached. There's a movement, but the dude has a platform. The first thing that happens, though, is Christians who probably have prayed, God, have a revival in Hollywood. The first thing we do is it shows up and we criticize the way that it's happening. Nah. It's 
don't you ever just feel like Jesus would like to just snap kick us in the face sometimes? Because we pray for something, he gives it to us, and we're like, I don't like it. I wanted a blue one. That is what we do. God, move in Hollywood. I don't like that way you did it, God. I don't like this church. I don't like your people. It's what we do. Come on. This is what we do. This is real church today. It's what we do. And sometimes I just, I don't know how the Lord does it. Just to keep enduring. Keep enduring. But in the middle somewhere, God's at peace. And our greatest goal isn't to get everything right. It's to find the God of peace. Even in the midst of everything that could be wrong. Amen? They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. One of the problems I think we deal with and. This might be old school for some people this morning, um, but I don't think the word is old school. Amen. I think it's very alive and active now and still given foreign understanding. But never is there a substitute for gathering. And this is, this is dangerous. You ready? There's never going to be a substitute for gathering outside of biblical leadership. Amen. I'm not saying that because I need to control you, because I don't. can't even control myself, so I don't need any more projects. But whether you go to this church or somewhere, there is New Testament leadership that God has put on people to either shepherd, to be prophetic. He gave some to be, anybody know them? Apostles, prophets, teachers. Evangelist? Did you say pastress? And pastresses. <laughs> the point is, in fact, let's read it. I probably got it here. Ephesians 4.11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. It's a tragedy to me that we can gather Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and still don't know what the cross did. We think he just died to get us a ticket to heaven. We have no idea that it was about making a new creation, that literally who we were is gone, and you're a new creation that isn't even woken up to what it means to be under the blood of Jesus, to be pardoned by the blood of Jesus, to be the righteousness of God, to be hidden with him in heavenly place, to be seated with him in heaven. We have no idea what that means because we're so busy fighting over the color of the carpet or the fact that we don't like how God's moving in Hollywood. We have all these side conversations that we struggle to ever be fully paired to God and his call. And so it sounds like things are going good, but all of a sudden there's a skip and this interruption in the signal. Because even though we're trying to pair in unity, we're also paired to this frustration and criticism. I will say this, as long as you're being ruled by criticism, you will never walk in real honor and unity. It's not possible. doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion or thought about something. It just means that your opinion and your thought will never be more important than unity. Ever. Amen. There is no substitute for gathering outside of what God has ordained to be the pattern of the church age that we're still in. Amen. Let me say it like this. Billy Bob's worship night is not a substitute for gathering with the body of Christ under fivefold leadership. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Come on, the living room prophet ministry has to stop. As a, I love that, but not as a substitute for the body of Jesus. We say, well, I do gather. I gather with three people who agree with me on everything, and we have a great time. 
you, if you're going to mature, you need to find somebody you disagree with so the iron can sharpen iron and the body can learn to be the body. Because I'm not right about everything. And if I find three people who think I'm right about everything, chances are we're all wrong together and need to grow up somewhere. I don't want to be surrounded by people who are just like-minded, like-minded in faith. Yeah, Jesus is the issue. Let's gather on Jesus, but let's not divide on stuff that we don't even understand at the time. Will y'all speak in tongues? I'm going to a different church. Shut up. You don't. Here's how you, let me say that. Hold on. Let, let me. I'll say that in tongues. Shut, shut, shut up. That's how you say that in tongues. Because the problem is, most people who divide over something like that haven't even studied it out to begin with. They, they prophesy in the church. I'm going to go down to the church who doesn't do that. This is what we do. Meanwhile, we forgot that it was about exalting him. It wasn't about the stuff that we do. It was about the fact that he is worthy to be praised bigger than your understanding. God wants to be experienced more than he wants to be understood. You're not going to figure him out. Amen? And partly that's why he gave some... Because I will tell you this, and this is just the truth. Most people that God has put a calling of church leadership, which is really not, uh, l- let me say this, church leadership does not look like a pyramid. Right. It should look like this. Right. We're here to build up the body. for the min- There's a ministry to the saints. There's a ministry of the saints. The world's going to be born again because of a ministry of the saints, not because pastors have a big platform on Instagram and everybody follows them. That, that pop culture will not change the world. Amen. But God gave those people, and I have yet to meet one that's not pretty stubborn, except for myself. I haven't met many people, many people that God has put a call of leadership on that aren't just stubborn. And I think sometimes that's why God calls them, because he made them to be stubborn, because they would at least be stable. They wouldn't move every time it wasn't working. They wouldn't change every time that it, something didn't line up or feel right or do what. They're the type of people who get an assignment and say, we're going to stick to it and we're not going to move. And if you've got a different opinion about it, hush. So when you say, we shouldn't speak in tongues, pastor, I'm going to tell you, shut up. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. I'm say, go serve Jesus. Go worship Jesus. If you don't want to speak in tongues, don't. But don't criticize the person next to you that is. Because you don't know their story, you don't know the Holy Ghost, and you're certainly not the author of the gifts, so we're not going to act like we can control it anyway. Somewhere we've got to be mature enough to not all be the same, ladies and gentlemen, but we've got to be mature enough to gather in the midst of it and realize he is the issue. And I promise you, if people could gather that aren't all the same, don't, I mean, if we could really learn to be a unified, diverse people, that's what the world is craving right now and creating false versions of. We can't be a church culture that just swipes and goes to the next thing. And there is no substitute for biblical gathering. There is no substitute. I love, I love it. But Billy Bob's prayer meeting is not a substitute for the body of Christ. Jim Bob's Worship night is not a substitute. Susie Lou's living room prophecy church is not a substitute for, I don't know, I'm stepping on this because I don't know where we live. Amen. <laughs> I know where we live. And I don't care if this offends people in our region. We've got to be called to maturity. And maturity doesn't mean that you're the most serious, stale Christian in the world that knows everything. Maturity is that you've become stable enough that it is about Jesus, not all of his stuff, not about all the stuff that he does or does. It is about him in the middle. Can we just worship God together? Not try to figure it out for one Sunday, not try to figure it all out. <sighs> it's not about how many programs we do or don't have. Amen. It, it, oh, Jesus. It's not about your purpose driven anything. Yeah. It's about Him. Yeah. If you want to figure out who you are, start learning who He is. Yes. Because who you are is hidden in that place. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We've got to be able to gather greater than disagreement. Yeah. 
I know this is practical this morning, but I, I, I believe we are called, Unified City Church and, and more places in this generation, we are called to be a church who is so unshakable by petty division and by distraction. You, you remember, and it was the Genesis voice where God created mankind in his image. They're standing in this context of sonship, the literally overflow of God's heart manifest in the world with dominion and authority. They were paired to God. Their blinker had connected to his blinker. Whatever information was there was getting heard in the earth. Adam would even name animals because he knew they would be in agreement with God. And all of a sudden, this voice comes in that is nothing but distraction. And it convinces someone who has everything that they're missing out. And there's another model down the street. There's another model on the other side of this fruit. And if you'll just do it, you could have that thing that you are longing for. And the truth is, he wasn't longing for anything until deception had entered in. He takes the fruit and they disconnect. The pairing is gone. They're no longer paired with God. They're naked. They're ashamed. They're they're. They're broken. Do you understand that the reason they came under the curse, the, the, all the repercussion of what that brought, wasn't because they were just terrible. It wasn't because they weren't predestined. It wasn't because they didn't have value. It was because they were disconnected. The disconnection is what brought humanity's fall. The sin that led to it is what brought it. Why in the world do we think that we will ever walk out the full purpose of God in the context of disconnection? Come on, if you're walking through something in your marriage, do not dare disconnect. You might as well throw in the towel to things in your life. I'm not speaking that up in marriage. I'm just saying there is power and unity. That's why he knows this model works. That's why he died for family, not just for a couple. Amen. He called, could have called one disciple, he called 12. And there were characters. And there were quarrels. And there were moments, and it was funny sometimes. There was doubt, there was disbelief, there was loyalty, there was a lot going on. But if you look at the big picture, it was family. It was family. It is a perspective of family that can look down from the cross and say, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. That's family. That says, do you think that Jesus agreed with everything they were doing? Do you think he agreed with their assumption that he wasn't the son of God and they're crucifying him for basically being a blasphemer and they're rejoicing and celebrating. They're literally having a blast at murder. They're having a great time. It's a party around the cross for a lot of these people. Do you think he was in agreement with that? No, he was in disagreement with that. But it didn't stop the assignment. Thank God. He still died for people that he was in disagreement with. Can we really connect to people that we're in disagreement with? Let me, let me say it like this. Just because someone has a different political view than you doesn't give you the right to cast them off. Oh, I don't want to get political. But I'm so sick of the church thinking that a government's going to solve the problem. Come on, it's the government of the kingdom that will solve problems. Not the government. It doesn't matter who you put in the White House. They're still just a person. Amen. I'm not saying it's not important. I think we should vote. Do the best that you can. But at the end of the day, you're putting a dude in there. You're putting a dude in there that doesn't have as much authority as you think he does anyway. If you want to change the world, impact culture. Culture will change the world way more powerfully than, than politics will. Amen. I know this mess is, this is whoever's leaving the church today. Um, I want you to visit the kiosk. We have a gift for you. Um, <laughs> But, but let me say this, and I'll, I'll close up because I know, I know what's going on. I haven't even read most of my scriptures. Let me, let me read a few. Let me read a few so that we know. Let me also say this. 
Jesus, I am going to make a statement here, and I want you to hear my heart, okay? I want you to hear my heart. Oh, Jesus. Did you, do you guys know that Barack Obama was not the Antichrist? Okay. Because a lot of believers didn't know that when he was in office. They thought, no, this is it. This is the guy. And here's the problem. And I'm going to do this with Trump fans too. Again, I, have no, I don't care who's in office. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray that the Lord would do what only the Lord could do. Amen. Because God can change a heart, whether in the White House or not. We need to learn how to pray for people. Amen. Amen. But I'm also not going to act like, just, (laughs) I'm not going to get on Facebook and act like Donald Trump is the Archangel Michael and is representing the church of Jesus Christ. This is where we do have a gift for you. Again, if you're leaving today, (laughs) and here's the thing, I'm not against Trump whatsoever. And I do think we need to pray for the dude because he's getting so unrealistically attacked on so many levels. But do I think he is a Christian model that the church should be saying, oh, yeah, he's the best. He's the great. The dude has issues. Okay? But he's, he's taking the office of White House, not gatekeeper of heaven. So let's not act like he is here on behalf of the Lord. I'm not saying it's not the Lord's ordainment or assignment. I'm just saying do not make him the spokesperson for the church in America because that makes us look so stinking stupid when we do stuff like that, that the world looks at us and we instantly lose voice in conversation with people that we would disagree with. Now, again, I love who, whatever. I'm going to pray for the dude, love the dude. I think he's funny sometimes. He's dumb sometimes. And I mean that in love. I don't mean that like he's, I'm dumb sometimes, you know. Less, than, less times than him. But I'm, you know, I'm, the, no, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. But I'm saying, why in the world? Because this is a source of division in the church. It's politics. What a tragedy that something that is a model of the earth would have that much power over something that's supposed to be governed by the kingdom of God. That we would look and be, let me put it in scripture, we would be conformed to the pattern of this world. You understand that is a pattern of this world rather than be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Understanding that it doesn't matter who or what or where God is still God. I'm here serving that authority, that government, that kingdom. Again, pray for him. Pray God will do whatever. I'm not backing or not backing a candidate this morning, so don't project something that I'm not saying. I'm just saying stop making the answer for the world something so natural. That is never going to happen. I don't care if we have the best president in the world. It will never be a substitute for an awakening that will only come as creation in you, the sons of God, wake up, because that's what it's groaning for. Creation, the Bible doesn't say creation is groaning, waiting on a manifestation of the best government. It says it's waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God. The sons and daughters in this room to wake up, to realize who you are, and be so gathered together in it that we're no longer tossed to and fro. Let me read. The Bee Gees are kicking me out, so i got to read a couple... (laughs) Scriptures. See, I don't even like going to a church where they got to cut the message short. I'd like to be here till 2 o'clock. A couple, a couple more verses. So Jesus gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to quit the body for the service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants Here's, here's what it means to be an infant. We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Now, he didn't say bad teaching. He just said teaching. Which means even in the good stuff that God's doing doesn't give you an excuse to get out of position with the body. 
That's where I used to make a mistake because I thought God was moving. He was moving in power. I was seeing miracles. I was seeing God do things that I'd only ever read about. And I thought, man, that gives me the ticket to say this way is right. But the Bible also says the way that seems right that leads to death. And you can certainly use God's stuff as an excuse to divide. You can be pro-God but anti-Christ. Amen? This is why they struggled. So why the Jews, and as the transition, even with who Jesus was, they were struggling because they were so pro-God, but they were anti-Christ because they had an idea of how it would be or how it was supposed to look, and they never thought this guy would come looking just like them, eating bread with sinners, talking to a woman, of a different culture at a well, doing things that were absurd to some of them. It was improper. He came through the gate riding a donkey, not a unicorn. He, he wasn't coming in military might. He came humbly. That's because he knew we would start to praise the thing that he's on rather than praise him. If he came with a full army behind him, we said, yeah, he's here. But in the reality is we'd really be celebrate, celebrating the moment rather than celebrating the God. To not be tossed back and forth by the ways and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and cunning craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who was the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting limit grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 1 Corinthians, you don't have to follow me on these. I'm just going to read them to close. But 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28. You, uh, now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, guidance, and of every kind of tongues. Here's, here's one of the things that I, I want to hit. And again, I know I'm going long this morning, but whatever. It says that he gave first apostles, prophets, teachers, and then gifts of healing, of tongues, of miracles. One of the things that we, one of the areas we, I think we, we really miss it sometimes, especially in charismatic circles, is we have this tendency to follow the movement rather than the mover. And so because there's tongues or miracles or an outpouring, we forsake what it means to be under biblical leadership. But this model says that he first, I love that he even terms it this way, he first gave this because it is the foundation for what would become the miraculous. And if you do one without the other, you can get in a miracle camp that is great, but you'll be all over the place. And it can quickly go from the spirit of Jesus to the spirit of something else. It can quickly go from and outpouring to performance. Some of the greatest moves in church history where God moved in power, even some of the church leaders, uh, I think it was Toronto specifically, there's this crazy move, but then it just got weird. It got weird in the sense of flesh, and even some of those guys came out later saying, yep, we just tried to keep it going way too long than we were graced for, and it got into an area that just was not the Lord. You know what that tells me is sometimes God's doing something, sometimes he's not. Now I'll also say this to the non-charismatic people. If you think that God doesn't move in power and wants to move in power, I'm going to tell you right now, the house of God on a Sunday morning should be so full of the anointing of God that the sick can come, the needy can come, the hurting can come, the lame can come. And if anybody on the planet... We should be the ones who are going to contend and believe God. We should pray every single time like God can do it. But sometimes we pray as if, eh, it'd be nice. We need to learn how to contend as the body of Jesus. Amen? We should challenge everything. It doesn't matter if you understand it or say, man, I just don't think God wants to do that. God doesn't really care what you think sometimes. Sometimes he wants to heal somebody. Amen? Sometimes God wants to move and outpour and do things. What I'm saying is it's not one or the other. 
And if we're going to gather, we have to gather under a place of stability that when the seasons of God are changing, we don't run around, toss to and fro, even if it's good. We've got to stay connected. Amen.